Hi, David Vizard here, and you are watching Power Tech 10. In this episode, that'll be 151, I'm going to look at something which I know is dear to all of your hearts, except those of you who are multimillionaires on up. That is what we get in terms of performance per dollar spent. Now, there's lots of things you can do that aren't talked about. I unfortunately have the experience of being so broke that I could barely afford to pay attention. Now, when were, the, when were these days? Way back. I grew up in war-torn England. You cannot believe how set back we were after financing to a very large extent a huge part of World War II. Not only did we arm ourselves, but we also helped industriously to arm the Russians and anybody else who was fighting on our side. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, but I read somewhere, and I'm not going to vouch for its accuracy, that in England we produced more aircraft in World War II than the US did. I think it was three more during the war years. Now, that sounds like we really worked our butt off. Well, we didn't produce many transport aircraft. We left that up to you guys because you already had the DC-3, one of the most iconic airplanes ever. More iconic, if you think about it, than a Spitfire or a P-51. Not quite as glamorous, but more iconic. Now, the point is this. During those dark and financially forlorn times, I could barely afford to buy a moped engine. A 50cc, put it on the back of your bike and a cogged wheel drove it on the back tire. And the ones that I did manage to get were well and truly worn out. And it was up to me to recondition them the best I could. Well, I did some things there that I know professional engine builders would go, <gasps> the point is this, what can we do for low buck and get away with it? Now, I want to interrupt your train of thought here. This video has been prompted by the fact that I've got a 427 small block Ford for sale. This was a project I did with Trick Flow Specialties and DSS Racing. And it happened right about the time I had my brain surgery. Terry, bless his cotton socks, called me the other day and said, do you realize you've still got this DSS slash TFS engine up here? And I said, what DSS? TFS engine and he said it's a 427 you you had all the parts for and we built it for you right around the time you had your brain surgery and I said I've got no recollection of it none whatsoever now we're five years down the road now and here's something to note neither DSS or TFS have complained about the fact they gave me a bunch of parts to do a project with which five years later I haven't done so guys I want to thank you for your patience which has been unbelievable now it's cropped up this deal has cropped up just as I was going to do this dollars per horsepower deal so it's appropriate to put it in here I'm going to show you with this 427 that at the price I want for it it's the bargain of the century, but we'll get to that in a moment. Now it's all very well just talking about the price of speed equipment or speed moves, but to be able to balance out expenses into categories that are meaningful, we have to look at Probably three things. One, 
What have you already got? Because it has value. Its value will depend largely on how close to usable it is currently. So, let us say you have got a long block. Because that's where most of the expense will go. So, so we'll put that in one box. The next box over will be what you have to do or spend to make that long block as functional as if it were virtually a brand new long block assembly. That's the next box. Then there's the last box. That contains the parts you have to buy to make the other two boxes a functional entity when combined with the third box. Now hopefully that all made sense. Now the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to start off with what we've got or we should have. Then we're going to move on to how we can fix what we've got or should have. Lastly, we're going to look at the machining operations or components that involve expenditure of cash that represent the best moves for power gained per dollar spent. Hopefully, by combining everything there, we will get a power unit which represents the best value in terms of reliability, you own it, and it makes horsepower. That's the goal. I think that's everybody's goal. But let's move on to the next step. The first thing at this point is to give you an idea of what you should be looking for in terms of an engine. Now, this may be one you've got or one that you want to get. First, just check the oil in it and see how clean slash dirty it is. If it's clean and it's not gritty to your fingers, there's a chance that things have not worn that much inside, even if it's got over 100,000 miles on it. Secondly, Fuel injected engines are very good at extending the bore life of the engine considerably. That means that you may get an engine with 100,000 miles on it and the bore wear is inconsequential. So that's the first thing to look out for. Why? Because we can get away with not having to put new pistons in. Okay. Now let's, that's the first step. Second step is to see whether or not the bores are reusable. Now if there's a step at the top of the bore more than say a couple of thousands you might want to think about doing something to straighten it out. You've got some options here. You don't have to bore and hone the cylinder to a fixed oversize. That's not necessary. But before I get to explain that, let's have a look at and see what we can do with a bore that just needs freshening up. First, you're likely to find that the piston clearance is probably a bit more than it needs to be. Now, this is actually not a bad thing. You can resize pistons quite easily. The first way to do it, now this will sound terrible to some people, is you knurl the pistons. Don't have a lathe and a knurling machine? You can do it with a center punch. Just support the piston well, especially the skirt, put something in there to support it, and then very carefully center pop the thrust faces of the piston. A fairly healthy ding, you want metal to come up. And you want to put these center pops about a quarter of an inch apart, but focus them more on the 
uh, center part of the skirt. Now this sounds terrible. And you, you'll probably find the piston won't go in the bore. That's exactly what you want. Now what you will do is you will very carefully file those lumps or maybe just emery them over until the piston will fit in the bore with a sheet of this notepad paper between the skirt and the bore. Now that's about three to three and a half thou. It's got to slide in with no rock but no effort to push it in. Now you're going to think, boy, that's a lot tighter fit than I had with uh, the uh, last engine I built. They wanted 5,000 clearance with it. Don't worry about that. The bearing area on the piston is so small that if the piston gets a bit tight, it will wear the peaks off those dimples very quickly. Once it's done that, believe it or not, that dimpling, assuming you use a good oil, will last a long time, far longer than it takes you to make your first $100,000 to buy engines with. So that's not a big deal. And, and as for knurling, uh, I had a good friend of mine who had the machine shop bore the cylinders wrong and he bored extra clearance on top of what his brand new Cosworth pistons were supposed to have. So instead of having uh, 4 thousandths clearance, it had something like 9 thousandths. Way too much. Oh, let me go back a step here. Now, I said, let me fix it. What I did was I knurled his pistons. I had a, I could put my, them in a lathe and I made up a, 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 a block to go inside that was a good, it's a wooden block, good press fit in there. And I knurled those pistons, or the skirts, and then filed them to fit with about a 4,000 clearance. Now this was an engine intended to make a 1,000 plus horsepower, which it did by the way. Now, all of those pistons uh, fitted beautifully. I gave him back the pistons and he about panicked. There was his super expensive top of the line Cosworth pistons knurled, hadn't even been used yet. Well, I said, look, if you don't like it and they don't work, I will buy your next set of pistons. Now, that's a question of, again, putting your money where your mouth is. I didn't have to buy a next, another set of pistons. We didn't tear that engine down until it had got probably 35,000 miles on it. And a lot of those 35,000 miles were put on the floor, pulling out a thousand foot pounds plus. This engine was a rocket ship. The car that it went in, which was a Mazda, uh, did a best of 8.63 at, I think it was 162 miles an hour at um, the uh, drag strip at Palmdale. And when we looked at the skirts on it, barely worn. I think they may have worn no more than half a thousand. And who knows, that wear may have been in the first 500 miles. Probably was. So, Knurling is not as bad as you might think it is. Now, I'm not saying it's good. Piston manufacturers go to a lot of trouble to get piston skirts right. But what I'm saying is, is you can bypass that to an extent. Now, let's say your bores are more worn than just, uh, how should we say, um, 2000s. Go to the machine shop and have them hone the bores until they just clean up. Now, they're going to be 2000s oversize or a little bit more. Well, here's the thing that works for you. Most piston rings are made to suit a 5 over bore, which means if you had to hone 3000s out of your block, you still haven't reached the maximum size that the piston ring will accommodate. So you'll still have to gap it down because it's still got plenty of outward uh, preload. Now a lot of people call that ring tension. It's not ring tension, it's ring compression. Tension is when you suck something in. Compression is when you it pushes out, right? But hey, I'm not about to try and change American terminology here because it's one of me and 330 million of you guys, right? 
Now, if it was only 100 million, I might take it on, but no way at 330 million. Now, let's get back to the story here. So, what you do here is you dimple your pistons or, or knurl them uh, to get them to fit. Make sure you support the piston skirt here. Dinging it like we're going to has a possibility of bending it and defeating the object to the exercise which is to uh, build the piston skirt up. Now this work piston looks cleaner than uh, you might expect that's because I soaked it in carburetor cleaner for a couple of days. Now carburetor cleaner is not like anything like as good as it used to. I could have soaked that for half an hour in, in the carburetor cleaner we got 25 years ago and it would have come, come up like this but it took three days and some some wire brushing to get it that clean. Anyway, there's the dimples. Now I'm going to do one just here to show you about how hard I hit it. There we go. About that hard. But there's one more method that I'm going to show after I've shown you the big Windsor. So where are we at at the moment? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you what my DSS slash Triplow Specialties engine has in it and how much power it made and what it costs compared with Summit. Now I'd like to make a point about Summit here. They may not always have the best prices but they're always amongst the best. If you want to check to see whether you're getting a good price on something, just check to see what the summit price is. You probably will find that it's as good as anything and they have just the most awesome for the customer return policy. Now let's have a look at the engines of the same order as the one I've got here for sale. Let's see what they've got in terms of 427s. First, they've got one here at 14,660 something dollars. It's built by Ford, but basically you only get a long block assembly. So, although they advertise it at 535 horsepower and 545 foot pounds, as you see it here, it won't make any of that. To make any power it's going to need a complete induction and ignition system and of course there is no guarantee that the one you choose especially the induction system is going to perform well enough to make the figures that are claimed for this engine this roush build is next on the list i believe i sat in on a dyno run with one of these a while back and it performed very nicely thank you and definitely made the horsepower claimed, which, as it happens, is only 480 horsepower with a torque topping 500 by 10 or 15 foot-pounds. As for cost, it's almost $17,000, but it is a turnkey deal. Put oil in it and it will fire up. And here's Summit's top-of-the-line Roush deal. Equipped as you see it here, it cranks out 550 horsepower and 535 foot-pounds of torque. It will set you back a handsome Well, you're getting dyno printout figures here because I've had such a big demand. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't make any difference to what you actually see. You're going to get the graphs anyway. But these are the numbers that the dyno printed out. And these are the numbers that generate the colored fancy graphs that some of you don't seem to like, but publishers love it. That's about as low as we could pull the engine. I think... It was limited to about 2,600 RPM because it did make a lot of torque down at the bottom end. Engine idled nicely 
at 800 RPM with no perceptible lope to it, pulled enough vacuum to operate vacuum brakes, and the torque climbed up from there. By the time we got to 5000 RPM, we were looking at a solid 560 foot-pounds of torque. That's more than any of the uh, engines we've just shown you made. As for horsepower, that went right up to 587. And again, that's 37 more than the highest output Roush engine made. It's going to be surprising how all this is possible. But for now, let me just show you the graphs. I'll explain how it was done later. Here's our raw graph. There's the peak torque. And right alongside of that is the peak horsepower. We did good. And I'll tell you something else. Part of why we did good was the Trick Flow Specialties 7R heads that we used. There's something I'm going to tell you later on. And that will bring the effectiveness of the heads much more to the fore than you're seeing here. Anyway, let's look at some pictures of what we've got. So here's the first view. Working our way from the top down, we have for the induction a uh, large CFM Holly HP. I believe this is either a 950 or a 1050. It's just that under the circumstances, I can't quite remember. Going down from that, we have a Super Victor for an intake manifold. That, as I remember, was ported by yours truly, matched up to the cylinder head and just given a uh, suitably rough finish with 60 grit emery to reduce fuel puddling. Dropping further down the engine, we come to a one-of-a-kind valve cover logo. There is only going to be one of these, so if individuality scores any points in your book, here it is. It doesn't make the vehicle go faster, but you will have the only one in the world. As for the ignition system, it's an MSD distributor with the curve developed on the dyno by Jack Sane personally, he, and he's good at this. Neither of these next two items that I want you to note are on even the $20,000 Roush engine. That is a high-volume electric water pump and... Just behind it, a belt drive so that you can time the cam in on the dyno for maximum results. By now, you should be able to see we're not into cost cutting on this engine. Once again, as an upmarket deal, we've got this ATI damper, which in part is the reason we're able to turn more RPM than the Roush engines because the crank damper is tuned to the crankshaft and damps better. Last on our list of good stuff is the Trick Flow heads. In fact, it's the combination of these heads and a camshaft, which incidentally is 10 degrees shorter than the Roush camshaft that netted us the results they did. Now, I want to say a little bit, bit about compression. We were not running the 10.5 that the Summit engines we've shown were running. Because this was intended for a truck and heavy throttle for long periods like towing up a hill, we dropped the compression into the nines. There you have it. To get the rest of the spec on this engine, you have to watch the next video. So now back on to our piston stuff. I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm going to tell you this piston reconditioning process that I'm going to uh, describe here I'm just going to give you a hint as to what it involved. A nut and a bolt and the expense of about $2. For that, you can make any forged piston up to 5 thousandths oversize and any cast piston up to 3 thousandths oversize. So, in either case, it's unlikely that you'll have a bore that requires more than about a 3 thousandths hone. So, I know I promised I was going to say, tell you all about this at the beginning, but you're going to have to wait until episode two of this reconditioning deal. Here, I'm going to tell you how to finish off the piston reconditioning, what you should do about rings, etc., etc., and then moving on 
to other components within the engine. I think I'll tackle cylinder heads next, how to recondition those on the absolute minimum cost, and also how to upgrade them into a pocket port deal with the minimum amount of bother and if you're an engine uh, machine shop if you're a motor machine shop here's a way to pocket port them or at least send them out the door so that the end user can just do two minutes per port to finish doing a really good pocket porting job with a potential for about 30 horsepower increase so that's the end of today's episode i will see you on the next episode but please don't forget to subscribe share comment uh have us inform you when the next edition's on etc etc and don't forget we do need those super thanks just keep it in mind we're working hard for you let's see some appreciation there thank you for watching <music>